So now I'm very pleased to turn to our final speaker of this panel, Russell Smith. Um, Russell is an independent scholar and he has extensive expertise in black British military history. So when you're ready, Russell, over to you. Hey, um, just double checking if everyone can hear me all right before I proceed. Right. Yeah, so talking, uh, talking from water to wind, actually, the legacy in a changing day. If the Earl of the South of Warsaw meant, saw plenty of subjects ready and willing to come to the aid of the mother country at her hour of need. There is no doubt as to the contributions from African, Caribbean and black British personnel, whom the RAF provided a home for, uh, to the majority of the 10,270 Jamaicans, 800 from the Dadians, 417 British Guyanese and just over a thousand from Caribbean colonies to join the British war. The question to be asked, however, is why? What was in it for? First, it is useful to consider some of the motivations for their service, and whether there was, uh, whether there is any more to the matter than a sense. Of there are opportunities in war and available at home for a better life, and hopefully the chance to continue forward in that manner. After the war, there remain significant challenges, though experiences outside of combat still serve a few of them well. This article examines ways in which their wartime experiences set a useful tone for managing tough civilian battles against societal barriers, threats of direct violence, and improving society by setting down new routes for themselves and future generations. First question to ask is one of, reasons, uh, of, one of possible reasons to serve. Clearest apparent motivation is grounds of duty, in which protection of the mother country is seen as a patriotic urge or even obligation to some and on intellectual and moral grounds. In terms of colonial service, the First World War left its own baggage. Stephen Bourne in Under Fire, Black Britain and Wartime 1939-45 states, for black people in Britain and many other parts of the empire, the First World War changed their understanding of the empire and their place within it. It was during wartime that black people from parts of Africa and the West Indies gained new and first-hand experience of the racism and racial hierarchies that both informed, and for many, justified colonial rule, by which all subjects of the empire in some capacity experienced some temporary lifting of barriers regulations and, restric and restrictions for the sake of ensuring that a war was won, and this left the world with a taste of what could be in some ways. Historian David Olshoga adds that in the First World War, volunteers from the Caribbean islands joined following, de uh, following debate, following the fear at this time, perhaps unlikely, of German invasion, and more directly, a war fever and enthusiasm to serve the mother country itself a hangover from some older esteem held going back to Queen Victoria. This already helped set the tone for debate and for freedoms and equality. In Britain, George Padmore was hard at work as a black rights activist during the interwar, uh, interwar years, and by the outbreak of the Second World War was in firm position to lobby for self-determination among the colonies. In 1939, he stated, it was it is only when there is some riot in Jamaica or shooting in Palestine or unrest on the northwest frontier that the average Briton is made even remotely conscious of his responsibility over the hundreds of millions of coloured people over whom the British ruling class speciously claimed to be exercising a benevolent trusteeship. Yet revolutionary tendencies do not be, appear to be the primary, uh, primary motivator for, uh, for service volunteers. Jamaican Eddie Noble worked in sales until joining the RAF, taking, inspir taking inspiration from an old Coward film. From the moment I saw the film in which we serve, I had made up my mind that no self-respecting, able-bodied young man could honorably remain at home when the fate of the world was literally at stake in Europe. Eddie, for black British historian Patrick Vernon's documentary film, A Charmed Life, cited both barriers and incentive. After I came to England, I found that the reason for this is that the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, objected to black men of serving alongside white men on equal terms. 
But a number of English businessmen in the West Indies wanted to make a contribution to the war effort, and they decided they would pay for young men to come to England to volunteer for the Air Force. The experiment was such a success that the colonial governors in the West Indies brought pressure to bear on the colonial office. So Churchill and the government in England was forced to change their, their attitude and they started recruitment, but it had to be voluntary recruitment, and I volunteered. Alan Wilmot just wanted to do his part at first. He started, join, he started by joining the Royal Navy and, and at age 16 as only, one, as only one of five accepted personnel. Yet he switched services to the RAF search and rescue as he felt he wasn't advancing within the Navy. I wasn't getting anywhere dicing with death and I couldn't see anything, which is when the sub strike. Sam King joined the RAF in 1944 with a simple reason. I don't think that the British Empire was perfect, but it was better than Nazi Germany. Bourne claims a certain romanticism in the case of Stork Squadron leader Ulrich Cross, Cross, DSO, DFC, in his reasons for joining the RAF, although it seemed fitting for the officer in question. Witnessing the defeat at Dunkirk in 1940 convinced him that Nazi Germany were an ever-increasing threat in Europe. Biopic film, Hero, portrays this decision slightly differently in that he and his peers debate whether to, come, uh, whether to, uh, whether to join after a collective reading of Mein Kampf and comes to the same conclusion as Sam King. In terms of contribution, Cross stands out as the highest ranking West Indian airman in the Second World War. One of 250 Trinidadians who volunteered to, uh, to serve the R in the RAF in 1941, Cross greatly exceeded the average life mission expectancy within his role as a member of the Pathfinder's bombing crew and operated as a navigator of a Mosquito fighter bomber. He successfully completed 80 bombing missions on Germany and occupied France. In June 1944, he was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and in July 1945, was awarded the Distinguished Service Order in recognition of his fine example of keenness and devotion of duty and exceptional navigation of, uh, navigational ability. So known was his, were his exploits during the war, the black character, squadron leader Charles Ford in Ken Follett's novel Hornet Flight was modelled on him, fitting as he was known within the squadron as the Black Hornet. Baron Baker joined the RAF in 1944 and served within the RAF police. A Jamaican volunteer, he apparently had no problems with racism until encountering American GIs in a confrontation in a Gloucester pub, calling their attempts to impose segregation naked, stinking, downright Hitler's fascism. He and his friends fought them hard, and this proved to be a, a formative experience in the war, which would prove valuable in later years. In the post-war legacy, 234 of the passengers of the Empire Windrush were accommodated in the deep air raid shelters underneath Clapham Common, close to Brixton. The use of Clapham Deep Shelter as temporary accommodation was the suggestion of, uh, of Baron Baker himself. Again, that experience served him well a decade later, as he's known to have been one of the driving forces behind organising the defence of the black community in the Notting Hill area in 1958 from Oswald Mosley influenced uh, his union movement, a descendant of the British Union of Fascists, held a stronghold in Notting Hill. This was since dubbed the Notting Hill Race Riots. We talk much about the Windrush, which is right because it's one of the iconic moments of black British history. Yet, as has been advised elsewhere, those involved in black British history talk of the dangers of the Windrush myth, the widespread misconception that black history began with the coming of that one ship. Whilst what was meant by those words entails going back way further in black British history than the 1940s, it to an extent applies to the other ships before, in fact, the Windrush made that iconic voyage. Alan Wilmot, for example, came across on the Arizona a year, uh, year previous and made a big name for himself in the British entertainment business, earning success with the Southlanders, an extremely popular band in the 1950s. Cross foreshadows a st uh, stint in broadcasting for the BBC with his appearance in the Pafé video West Indies Calling. Following this, he subsequent careers in law, justice and ambassadorial work called to the bar in 1949, then returned to Trinidad as a legal advisor, lectured in trade union history and trade union law for four years. 
He returned to London and the BBC as a talks producer for a for further four years and then spent from 1957 to 71 across Africa, putting his law expertise to excellent use in Ghana, West Cameroon and Tanzania. A final move back to Trinidad saw him gain the position of the chairman of the Law Reform Commission of Trinidad, where he made a significant contribution towards furthering the revision and development of the country's laws. Some of his judgments changed the landscape of Trinidad and Tobago, noted the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago at the time of his death, which was tw uh, in 2013. So in conclusion, as much as it's been a matter of integrating communities, changing values and minds with the times, and frankly most of the time surviving, the personnel mentioned here came across uh, came about with a willingness to fight for the mother country, which then evolve, evolved into fighting for the vision of the mother country every one of them wanted and needed to see. Although many important victories have been achieved for those who remain, the conflict continues in new ways to this day. It started with the pure fact that taking up the fight as a subject of the empire was a battle to ensure there was a tomorrow, hearing all the events in Europe. They also had to deal with a real change in attitude from the subjects of the motherland itself. Protective as the public had been during the war with the culture clashes between the British, the African-American GIs and the white American GIs after the war, questions of what are you still doing here and resistance to immigration from a number of directions whilst trying to direct the empire in Drush and Sam King's own efforts to counteract that to history repeating itself with regards to repatriation, immigration and existing racial tensions. Parallels with the end of the First World War can be seen again by many. Compare, the inst uh, compare, for instance, the murder of Charles Wotton in Liverpool 1919 to that of Kelso Cochrane in Notting Hill the year, uh, year after the riots 40 years later. And one might initially question whether had any improvement or impact had been made. The common factor on what was wanted was change. Like the non-service like non personnel, the Windrush generation had pride, defiance, and to make a better world, a determination to make a better world, which both inspired the decision to join up and fight for the mother country in the UK. And that served them just as well in the years, de decades and generations that followed. The Windrush legacy haven't even fought their last battles yet. Far from it, as even headlines at the time of writing will attest to.